So, all right. Hey, peace and love, family. Peace and love. Um, today we have a special guest, Dr. Tudar Parfit. Um, it's go not going to be the greatest interview under very sad circumstances, but um, Dr. Parfit, I appreciate you still coming on and taking up the time, even with your personal issues. I want to say that my second favorite scholar of all time, Art Irvin, is number one. Unfortunately, you're number two. But you relate to me as an individual in the African-American community, although I was born in, and raised in Jamaica. Um, you deal with a lot with the lost tribes. I'm sorry I got to be so succinct, family, but we got to get to the point because Dr. Um, Parfit cannot stay long today. Peace and love, Dr. Um, Parfit. Can you just introduce yourself so we can just get this going? Dr. Parfit? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right. All right. I was saying you could just go ahead and introduce yourself to the audience. Okay. Well, very, very nice to meet you all. Uh, my name is Tudor Parfit, and um, I'm currently a professor at FIU, Florida International University in Miami. And prior to that, I was professor at the School of Oriental and African Studies in the University of London for many years. I've written some 31 or two books. And uh, for quite a number of years, I've been dealing with the issues which I believe were of interest to you um, about the Lost Tribes and um, more recently um, uh, issues to do with, um, with color in Judaism, black Jews, Jews in Africa, and so on, to which I have um, uh, contributed quite a lot uh, academically. And I think also in, uh, in the wider realm and my latest book, <clears throat> which just came out a few weeks ago, is this. It's published by Oxford University Press, and it's called Hybrid Hate, Conflations of Anti-Semitism and Anti-Black Racism from the Renaissance to the Third Reich. All right. I actually have it on the screen for you. So that oh, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you very and, much. And ladies and gentlemen, by the way, do not watch my channel anymore if you don't purchase this book. I think this book wraps everything up that we needed to make closure on. And I really appreciate this book. It's funny. I was having a debate three, four weeks ago or two months ago, and stuff in this book would have answered all those questions, and I didn't know about the book. But through Google, I was able to find the book, and I actually have the book. I've read some of it. I haven't read all of it and I will touch on it. I'm going to leave it up for a little bit so people could see it. The book is called Hybrid Hate. All right. You have to purchase this book today. If you don't purchase this book, you're missing a key piece to understanding the term Negro, Black, how Black was used in, um, in Europe, how it was used in so, in so many different cases. But anyway, enough of me ranting. Um, I wanted to get to another book you have, which I have in my background, um, the Black Jews in Africa and the Americas. I think um, this is also a must read for every person that wanna talk about the lost tribes. Um, in page 73, you wrote, no doubt the chief mechanism for African-Americans enchantment with the idea of the lost tribes was the Bible, to which they had been unenthusiastically introduced in the slave farms of the South in the United States. It was the Bible as mediated initially by white slave owners and preachers that was the catalyst for the internalization of the Israelite trope. Do you want to talk a little about that, my brother? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's clear. Um, so <clears throat> by the 19th century, there were certainly hundreds of thousands of, uh, of slaves in the first half of the 19th century before the War of Independence, before the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And um, the, a kind of identification with, uh, uh, with Israel or with the idea of Israel or with Israelites um, came through essentially by um, imagining that there were parallels between the fate and suffering of the Israelites in Egypt 
and their own suffering in the uh, slave farms of the slave states uh, in the south. And um, this isn't, of course, the end of the story, but it's, uh, it's an explanation of why it was that the entire uh, community uh, formed a sort of identification with, uh, with Israel that we can see being acted out until today. Mm -hmm. um, and for those who are interested in hybrid hate, I'm going to flash it throughout the broadcast. In the, in the chat, I have one of my moderators who have the Amazon link to actually purchase the book today. All right. Um, you go on to say at the beginning of the 19th century, as you just said, very few black Africans in Africa were Christian and the slaves who arrived in the Americas were rarely Christians. Although some were Muslims, throughout the 19th century, the black population of the United States was exposed to a greater or lesser extent to Christianity, or at the very least to some biblical stories. This led to a new sacred, metaphorical, and later imagined world being created by blacks based on the Bible, which was to provide a haven for the racial contempt to which they were universally subjected. So pretty much what you just said is what I just read out of your book. So you really don't have to respond to that. But again, ladies and gentlemen, um, this is Tudor Parfit. So um, moving forward, um, a lot of folks I grew up with in Jamaica, the Rastafarian movement, which you, you wrote about also, they claim they are the, the lost 12 tribes. and. I come to America now and I see people saying I'm the lost 12 tribes. I read when you wrote that the lost 12 tribes was a myth. I think in 2012 or 13, you wrote it and probably a couple of more times. What do you have to say today in 2021? Do you still hold to the same sentiment or is there an, a, an addendum to that in any way, shape or form? Let's not be too literal here, Brother Garfield. Um, okay. Right, so my book, The Lost Tribes of Israel, The History of a Myth, was published actually in 2002. Mm -hmm. And in it, I uh, talk about the lost tribes, the, the history of the lost tribes, etc. And um, it's true that in some sense, and perhaps in the most obvious uh, historical, the most literal uh, 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 historical sense, uh, there aren't any lost tribes. So what happened, as you know, because you're all, I'm sure, Bible scholars, is that the northern kingdom of Israel in the uh, 7th century, uh, before the common era, um, were exiled, in fact, some elements of the northern kingdoms were kind of ethnically cleansed and taken to Assyria. And we know from um, uh, cuneiform tablets uh, in Assyria that for the next two or three generations, uh, members of these exiled tribes were to be found uh, in Assyria, working, in fact, as soldiers in the Assyrian army. And their names gave the, uh, gave the game away. They, they were all names like Ezekiel, son of Nun, or Israel, son of Jacob, these sorts of clearly uh, Israelite names. And then, after a few generations, you don't see this anymore. So. The assumption is that the uh, that the Israelites who'd been taken to Assyria were uh, in fact um, absorbed into the wider population. The problem was that um, the prophets uh, had proclaimed that one day the lost tribes would return, and um, this idea of the lost tribes returning at the end of days. Uh, was uh, also taken up by Christians and to a much lesser extent in, in, in Islam. And so that kept alive the idea that somewhere uh, on the periphery or beyond the periphery of the, of the known world, 
the lost tribes carried on a separate existence. This was sometimes thought to be in the East, more often to be thought of in uh, Africa. And so really this is the beginning of what is probably the longest living and most powerful uh, myth in the history of the world. That is, if you like, the technical sense of lost tribes. So if somebody says, I'm a member of the lost tribes, let's say Rastafarians in Jamaica, as you've mentioned, or let's say uh, African Americans, or let's say indeed um, um, Maori in New Zealand, or uh, various uh, tribes uh, in Africa, let's say the Igbo, let's say, uh, let's say the Zulu, um, they may uh, express, uh, you know, their, their desire to belong to the uh, to the people of Israel, or their sense that they do belong to the people of Israel through this myth. Um, but very often, it's um, it's concealing uh, some historical truth. So let's cut to the chase. The um, the existence of a uh, desire to identify with the people of Israel among African Americans or between uh, uh, people of African origin living in Central America um, is quite regularly articulated through the idea of the lost tribes. This in itself is a is a is a myth. Um, and very often it is formed as a result of a kind of metaphorical uh, uh, identification with, uh, with the people of Israel. However, that's not the only way uh, in which uh, a sense of belonging to the people of Israel might have occurred among slave populations in the 18th and early 19th century. And there's some evidence, not very much, but there is some evidence that um, slaves uh, had an idea of, um, of Judaism through Jewish uh, manifestations in uh, Africa. So an obvious example is Equiano, I'm sure you all know about him, yes, sir. Um, a, former, a former slave who mentioned um, Judaic practices among the Igbo. This is right at the end of the 18th century. It's a very interesting text. And he was talking about uh, Judaism in Nigeria long before uh, anybody had really said very much about the Igbo, uh, which was only to happen over the next um, few decades. Uh, some of my recent work, uh, if you read the um, hybrid mm -hmm. very attentively, You'll have to go to the footnotes. Uh, you will see there's got a lot of uh, a lot of uh, evidence um, produced for uh, black Jewish communities in different parts of West Africa, which are not sort of based upon a particular reading of tribal history. Let's put it like that, but are based from on um, fairly hard historical fact and the base uh, this hard historical fact is the expulsion of the Jews from Spain and from Portugal at the end of the 15th century subsequent to which um, a lot of Jews settled first of all in northwest um, Africa places like Senegal in the islands, <clears throat> which I'm sure you know about, Saint Tome and um, Principe, yes, sir, uh, uh, principally, uh, and then less known um, along the the coast of Guinea, uh, so that in the middle of the 50, middle of the 16th century, 1560 to be precise, the uh, Portuguese um, Archbishop of Goa in India uh, proclaimed that. Um, Judaism is a kind of horrible illness which has killed millions of people throughout history and um, the result of um, being Jewish 
was to be covered in, in shame, to fail in everything, um, even among the black Jews of Guinea. So in other words, the existence of Jews in the western part of Africa was absolutely accepted at the time uh, by the likes of the Portuguese Archbishop of Goa. And then travelers, Mango Park is a good example, uh, kept coming across uh, Jews or uh, evidence of um, Jewish settlements uh, in West Africa. And we know from various sources that there were, you know, uh, black Jewish communities practicing uh, uh, mainstream Judaism uh, from the end of the 15th century onwards through the next century and so on. And as far as the uh, black Jews that I talk about in this book, because they are the starting point for a, a wider uh, digression or a wider consideration of uh, more uh, uh, racial themes, or rather themes to do with the evolution of the race myth, has got to do with Loango. And there we've got very, very hard, relatively recent evidence uh, because there was a scientific mission to, to West Africa uh, uh, taken by the Germans in 1870, 1871, and they left behind huge tomes in German which describe, among other things, uh, this black Jewish community which was still at that time practicing a form of Judaism. So uh, Loango, where these people came from, was one of the main uh, slave exporting kingdoms in West Africa and therefore um, it is entirely likely that um, uh, some slaves anyway, I'm not saying it's all slaves and I certainly don't subscribe to the idea that all African Americans are naturally Israelites and they have replaced the Jews in the, in the Great Dispensation um, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that some Jews, both in Central Africa, uh, Central America and in the United States, had every reason uh, to be influenced by the Judaism that we know to, to, to have existed in the 18th century when they uh, crossed to the Americas, either from Loango or from points uh, north, uh, certainly Senegal and uh, further south, uh, possibly Nigeria. We don't know very much about the practice of Judaism in Nigeria at that time, but um, let's assume that Equiana was not lying. Mm -hmm. You know, um, what you said is, 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 is perfect. It actually sums up a lot of what you've been saying over the years that, you know, I don't, I always tell folks this, I don't have a problem with a Jew being any color, um, black, white, red, yellow, blue, or anyone who practices Judaism, but to, um, to put a label on me because I just happen to be a descendant of slaves and say, hey, he's an Israelite. I And based on what you just said about the Loango, because the evidence is pointing that the Loango was traitors based on the German information. Um, and I think a lot of people in my community now are saying that the Loango Jews were actually slaves and not traitors. And that, that's, that's where there's a little gray area in the in the conversation they're saying the Loanga jews were slaves what do you say to that? there's absolutely no evidence at all that um the Loango um uh jews black jews in Loango were slaves uh, quite the contrary um they had a a rather uh by the 1870s anyway uh they may have been looked down upon by the um indigenous africans but yeah by the you know by the uh, by, by the uh, majority uh, population in in Luanga. but they were prosperous they were more prosperous than the others the towns in which they lived were, were cleaner and they were sort of uh, better looked after and uh, they had a certain kind of um status uh, certainly they weren't slaves absolutely not and the one slave who spoke about them, and that is in the famous reference, well, it's famous now since I just heard it, uh, 
mm -hmm. by Oldendorp in 1777, um, that slave was not, was not himself a, a, a Jew. He simply said that a Loango, there were Jews, and they did X, Y, and uh, Z. So they didn't speak on the Sabbath. They they maintained the Sabbath. They they lived separately from the Negroes, as they were called in his text in German, Negel, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, and they had um, in their graveyards, which were separate, they had images of uh, snakes and lizards, which is fairly unusual and there was some speculation whether the speculation is correct or not i don't know but i don't think it probably is but you don't you never know it could be that the squiggles that were described by the slave when he was talking to the missionary actually refer to the squiggles of a cursive hebrew script if you know hebrew you could imagine that um you know the long tail of a kuf for instance Mm -hmm. but, uh, might re represent something like a lizard or a snake, but um, you know, I, 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 I take what you say. I mean, I think the kind of wider, uh, the wider sense in which I would understand the, uh, you know, the uh, the articulation of this uh, identification with Israelites as a black believing person in the United States um, follows a kind of me metaphorical uh, uh, identification. After all, in Christianity, um, as you know, um, Christians are the new Israel. It's not uh, that African Americans are the first to come to the idea of being Israelites. The whole of Christendom, in that sense, is Israelite. Some people take it more literally than uh, others and it's very interesting I think that um, you know uh, in Africa I think there's kind of distaste with um, a growing distaste with Christianity because Christianity is perceived as the religion of uh, colonialism and imperialism and so on mm -hmm. and it was introduced by missionaries who that true or not had their own agendas so the development of uh, African Christianity, in in a way, has been a kind of counterculture sort of development, and part of this counterculture is to um, is to stay to say, in a way, to the colonists, listen, you white guys, uh, we've got some news for you, which is that we actually are related to the main actors in this sacred history that you have brought for us but you don't belong to it and anyway that was um that was the first step if you like in a development of a certain kind of christianity which is merging into judaism and the african continent and at the same time islam is beginning to lose um traction simply because of its perceived relationship with in modern days terrorism and in uh historically with the slave trade so all of a sudden judaism looks like a pretty cool religion um it's got nothing at all to do with uh with uh, colonialism imperialism and it's got nothing at all to do with uh, the slave trade or with uh, terrorism and so there are those that believe, and there are signs that they may be right, um, that, um, you know, in time to come, Judaism will be one of the very major uh, religions in Africa. And you might say, as the literalist that I observe you to be, <laughs> oh. that, um, that this is based upon a myth all religions if you like are based upon a myth and all histories are based upon a myth myths national myths and individual myths our lives every single one of us uh, we act out the myths of our um, personal beliefs mm. which we like to think of as being historical yes but if you're a married man and you sit with your wife right. and reflect upon something that happened 10 years ago uh, i suspect there will not be a complete um 
uh, convergence of uh, ideas. I mean, in other words, you'll have completely different uh, views of what happened. So, you know, history is something to be used and is used by uh, by people. Yes. You know history. Um, I'm going to ask you for 10 more minutes because I know you have to go um, out of, um, because of the circumstances surrounding your day so far. <clears throat> uh, I have um, your book, The the Hybrid Hate, ladies and gentlemen. Please, this is the new book. I want to delve into the book, but I can't do it because it's going to keep him here forever and he has to go. But please purchase his new book, The Hybrid Hate by Tudor Parfit. All right. Um, let me get back to the black Jews in Africa for a second. On page, what is it? Page 159. Oh, no, I'm sorry. On page 163. I'm going to talk about the Lemba for a few minutes. It says, those Lemba with whom <clears throat> I have discussed the results often recall the fact that they habitually refer to themselves as the white men who came from Senya and that the DNA evidence proves that they were once white and that they are Jews. Can you elaborate on that? Because the, the lip, you have, again, a lot of people claiming the identity and attach themselves, but these folks in Lemba, which I've never spoken to any Lemba, you have done the field research and everything. Can you elaborate on that quote you have in the, um, the Black Jews in Africa and the Americas? Yep, I mean, the. They certainly uh, traditionally referred to themselves in that way. They, they were black and they were living among uh, black people, uh, black tribes um, in Zimbabwe and northeastern South Africa, and also in places, although I never met them in Mozambique myself, but I understand that there are some in Mozambique. I did meet some in Malawi, which is the country just to the north of um, of Mozambique and um, and uh, Zimbabwe, and um, you know the uh, Sena, the you know when I, when we were doing this, uh, when I was doing my kind of field work and my uh, anthropological field work, uh, nobody knew where it was, and uh, it may be that um, uh, I discovered it um, in the Yemen. It, it's a possibility, and the evidence is quite strong without being 100% um, uh, strong, I would say. And part of the evidence, well, I'll, I'll tell you. So um, the, the, the legend of the Lemba, uh, this may be by now 100,000 strong people living in uh, Central Africa uh, with claims to being of Jewish origin um, and which in pre-colonial times certainly seemed to have a religion which was very close to Judaism as far as one can judge. I'm giving you the, the uh, absolute uh, truth as I understand it in, this, uh, in these statements. Uh, so they have this um, idea of being of Jewish origin. I met them uh, in uh, 1985 for the first time. Um, I just written a book upon the about the Ethiopian Jews and their um, rescue by Israel in the Operation Moses. I went to South Africa. I met some of these uh, Lemba, and they they told me their story. And they said, "Yes, um, uh, we know that we came from Senna. We crossed Pusela. Uh, we came to Africa. We rebuilt Senna." And then we moved inland, and we became dispersed among the uh, among the nations. That was their theory of origin, their legend of origin, uh, in short. So I decided to write a book about this, and uh, so the way I was going to write the book was to go on a journey to try and solve the question of where Senna was. And were they Jewish? That was the idea of my journey. It was the idea of the book that was written as a journal. And uh, I didn't succeed in either of those objectives in the first version of the book. It was nonetheless an interesting book, and I'm proud of the book. It really was. Uh, it was worth doing, and I enjoyed doing it. And I think it was quite a good book. 
so a little bit later, like a couple of years later, I was in the Yemen. I told the story of the um, of this book to a muhtar, to a Muslim holy man. And he said, if you go to the end of the Wadi Hadramaut, which is, by the way, mentioned in the Bible, uh, you will find a place called Sena. And we do have a tradition that people left from there to go to Africa when a great dam burst a thousand years ago. And so I went there in my Land Rover and discovered this ruined place where some people were still living. And I also discovered that the tribal names of the people living there at that time were the same as the tribal uh, names of the Lemba in Zimbabwe in South Africa. Now, I thought that was a pretty good piece of proof. I discovered a Senna, there was a legend of people leaving to go to Africa, the tribal names were the same, and conscious of the fact that this was fairly circumstantial, I decided to do DNA testing, which tested um, the population of the Hadramaut against the population of uh, the Lemba in uh, Central Africa, but as well as that, there were test populations that we collected, uh, both in uh, the Yemen and also in different parts of Africa, including Mozambique and, um, and different parts of South Africa. So we had a very big collect of DNA and the uh, resulting um, work was pretty impressive in, in, in terms of demonstrating that at least on the male side, the, uh, the Lemba originated out of Africa and in the Middle East. There was a another aspect to this, um, which had to do with something which I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, called the Cohen modal haplotype. And so, a year before all of this was happening, we did a very interesting piece of research that was based upon the closeness. Um, in the way that it worked of on the one side um, the Jewish priesthood and how you become a Jewish priest which is by uh, inheriting that status from your father uh, and grandfather great-grandfather and so on throughout history and that's the only way that you can be a Jewish priest is to be born one uh, from a uh, from a priestly father and the Y chromosome uh, which similarly you get from your father and uh, he gets it from his father and he gets it from his father and so on throughout history it doesn't change over history any more than the status to priest changes throughout history so we put these two things together in our research project and we discovered that um, you know that uh, a good uh, proportion of the lemba had this uh, this uh, haplotype and um, the priestly clan of buba um, had it in much the same uh, way as uh, the um, you know the, the wider jewish population so the first person to do this was actually somebody called Jenkins. He's a, like me, a Welshman, Welsh Christian. And he was doing his work unbeknownst to me as I was um, in the Yemen finding, Yemen, uh, finding Senna. So he published the first thing which kind of broadly made the same conclusions as we subsequently did, namely a Semitic origin for the Lem. But we kind of expanded this in the sense that um, we actually found a Middle Eastern population to which it could be appropriately uh, compared. And we added the element of the, uh, of the newly discovered um, priestly haplotype. In subsequent work, his, um, one of his PhD students uh, took the same data and um, argued that the uh, that the uh, Cohen modal haplotype, this uh, constellation of, uh, of genetic uh, material, totally unimportant uh, material, by the way, it's got nothing to do with anything other than the fact that it's saying, you know, where in the world you originate from. Um, and 
she expanded it to a, a, a slightly greater degree, uh, which would have involved more people, but it didn't really um, particularly undermine the original conclusions that were made in the paper in Nature in 1999. And I think most people to this day would regard that as being uh, fairly robust. Um, but at the same time, I would say this, and this is something that um, Brother Garfield, I don't think you know, mm -hmm. but you may. Uh, you've obviously done your research. And uh, so I'm not sure about this. This is uh, speculative, but, but it's interesting. So if you look at a map of um, Africa um, and you look, you see where the Lemba are living, and originally they were living in and around um, where the Great Zimbabwe uh, sort of main site is, more or less bang in the middle of, uh, of, of present day Zimbabwe. So not a million miles away, uh, going west, um, there was another Lemba phenomenon uh, which existed in the area of uh, today's Republic of Congo. Uh, I think it probably went as far north as Gabon and also into the um, uh, Demo Democratic Republic of the Congo, which is that vast, vast uh, part of West Africa. And this was a kind of... Um, it was something like a secret society. It was a society of healing. Uh, the people concerned were doctors, medicine men, and the symbol of their um, activities, uh, this lemba activity, was a, was a drum of healing. Now, to non-Africans, this isn't making much sense, but if you're steeped in African history, African traditions, the, the weight of the idea uh, of the drum is considerable. And the drum of the lemba at the same time is hugely important, it's called Ngoma. And, you know, in the book I wrote about the Ngoma, and some of you may have seen the um, History Channel movie I did. Um, I have connected the story of the Lemba drum uh, with the idea of the Last Ark of the Covenant. It would be easy to, to mock this and to say, hey, you think you found the, the last tribe of the, uh, the Last uh, Ark of the Covenant? Absolutely not. But I never said that. All I said was that the idea of the last ark, uh, uh, you know, the last ark, the ark of the covenant, uh, somehow entered Africa, and it seems to be uh, represented in the uh, tr in, the, in the tribal uh, legends, uh, well, realities, uh, the tribal history of the Lemba. So what you have is you've got a, a receptacle made of wood. And if you know your Bible, you'll know that there are two um, descriptions of the Ark of the Covenant. One is that it was um, it certainly made of wood, but covered in gold, and it was quite an elaborate thing. And uh, it had a, a lid on the top, and there were uh, sort of angels or, uh, at uh, each end of the uh, top. Not really angels exactly, but uh, figures anyway. And that was the, uh, so to speak, the footstool of God. So and the and this object was made by um, Batsalel, the great craftsman. But in the book of Deuteronomy, you will see that um, uh, Moses himself uh, made uh, an ark, and this was simply made from the acacia trees that were growing on uh, Mount Sinai, and he made this uh, kind of box and uh, ark just means box that's all it is and um or chest and he made it and the uh, the, the broken tablets were put in it and he took it down and uh, subsequently according to 
Jewish commentators, there were two arcs. One, the simple wooden thing was the, uh, was the arc of war, and the more elaborate thing was the arc that eventually went into the Holy of Holies, the De Vere at the, in the Temple in Jerusalem. So the simple wooden object, the arc of war, let us hypothesize, um, according to the book of Jeremiah, was taken to a particular cave, um, there are Muslim accounts of tribes getting hold of this ark going down into the Yemen where our Lemba people may be from, seem to be from. And so that would give a kind of historical connection. And when you think that the, um, that the Lemba priests carried the, um, uh, you know, this relatively rare, uh, genetic signature connecting them perhaps with the uh, with the priests of the of the holy temple in Jerusalem um, carrying something which looks very much like the Ark of the Covenant which is to say it's carried on poles there are rings on each corner of this object which I found back in 2006 or 7 and which has got sacred object inside it which is carried into war which can kill people with its flames and you can go on and on and on the uh, the parallels between the two objects are absolutely overpowering i'm not in any way saying that um you know that the object i found was the original ark of the covenant but i would say that it was the great 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 grandson okay actually um I was reading an article by a brother from um, who you're probably familiar with. He actually is in opposition to what you're saying, um, Mr. Rob Barrett. I think that's his name. I'm not sure. And he basically thinks that the, um, the ark is something more likely indigenous or he actually is, is in opposition to what you're saying. But you're just giving out a hypothetical. You're not saying it's facts. So we're not going to take everything that you're saying literal, what you're just saying, you know? So I, I just I just wanted to say that for the audience before anybody takes what you're saying and run with it and make 10 videos. Dr. Parfit says they found the Ark of the Covenant. All right. Um, let, me, let me ask you this about the Cohen model type. Is it connected to the J. Hapler group? This is a basic question just for the audience. I know the answer, but I just want the audience to hear you say it. Yes, it's, um, it, it, there, there is a connection. Of course, uh, there's no point you or me really having this conversation uh, because I'm not a geneticist and nor are you. Mm -hmm. okay. Right, uh, right. However, the many, many geneticists who've worked using this uh, genetic material uh, and by now there are countless um, countless uh, papers and I think I've contributed to three or four of them but let me just tell you what my contribution is uh, I'm a historian mm -hmm. and, and a linguist so what I do um, I come up with an idea and so in the case of the Lemba well uh, the idea is what is the hypothesis? The hypothesis, they may be of Jewish origin. Mm -hmm. so you go to the geneticist, say, okay, that's interesting. So we can look at the, uh, we can look at the DNA of, of, of Jews and we can compare it with the DNA of the Lemba. And fine. So that's the hypothesis. And so the, the next thing is to collect the DNA. Now, collecting DNA is not very, uh, I mean, in the United States, it's dead easy. You just send everybody an envelope and they do something and they send it back bingo you've got it mm -hmm. if you're in central africa it's not the same uh thing right and particularly 20 years ago when people weren't familiar with the uh, you know with this uh, uh with this uh, with these techniques uh so that was my role it was collecting dna all over the world for different kinds of projects and coming up with a hypo hypothesis and then helping the uh, geneticists uh, who know what they're talking about uh, and you know they've spent 20 years you know learning this stuff. Mm -hmm. together you can kind of uh, you know form ideas and so you, you just you know you're looking at the stuff 
as it's coming out of their uh, computers. You say, yeah, okay, well, that's interesting. That would uh, suggest so and so and so and so. I'll give you another example. Um, so, <laughs> you know something about the Jewish diaspora. One of the kind of outliers is the is the Yemenite Jewish community, right? And partly because they are uh, dark colored, black in many cases. And most Jews are whitish, I suppose. And um, and the other thing is that they kind of, you know, the, the, there's a big gap in their history. So, you know, before about the ninth century, we don't really know much about these guys. Right. What we do know, however, is that in the third century, there's a Jewish kingdom just opposite Ethiopia uh, in Himya, which was a, a powerful state in the south of Arabia. Mm -hmm. And the king, uh, Dul Nawaz, uh, converted to Judaism. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then he subsequently, uh, you know, subsequently the aristocrats of, uh, of the kingdom of Himya uh, converted as well. Yes, and, um, and so that, you know, for quite a long time, we've got um, plenty of evidence, both in Israel in, in terms of uh, tombstones and sarcophagi, and also there in the Yemen, of course, at the moment, it's a bit difficult to get there to look at it. But anyway, in general, uh, that there was a Jewish kingdom in Himya. Mm -hmm. And um, OK, so um, we also know that some um, uh, Jews from Judea probably arrived there as a, a kind of military contingent at one point in history. Okay, so we're, we're now looking at the DNA of uh, Yemeni Jews who live up in the mountains, more or less where Himyar is, a little bit to the northeast, because right. that, most of it was kind of southwest. But anyway, sort of next door. Um, and what we find is that uh, there's a lot of connection with other Jews. And there's also a lot of connection with Yemenites, uh, with um, with Bedouin, right. uh, who live yeah. in the area of Himya. And so you put the, so they, they're saying, okay, well, I mean, we don't understand this. There's a connection with these guys, these Bedouin, and there's a connection with uh, with other Jews in different parts of the Middle East. How do you explain it? Well, the exp explanation is very straightforward. The right. explanation is that 2,000 years ago, you had um, Himurites who intermarried with uh, Jews, probably Jews that, uh, if you know your Quran, you know the, the walls between um, uh, the Prophet Muhammad and his Muslim followers and the Jews who lived in the Aces of the Hijaz, right. uh, many of them were, were killed, uh, destroyed, and some of them, no doubt, fled south. So that would be the origin of the, of the community which becomes historically visible in about the 7th or 8th century. So, mm. Wow. You know. that's, that's, thank you for that. Thank you for that. One, I have a few little questions um, regarding, is the CMH... The, the Cohen model haplotype, is it common among West Africans? And would it be fair to say the reason um, finding the Cohen model haplotype among some Lemba stands out is precisely because it is not common among African populations in general? It's not common among African populations in general, as far as I know, with the exclusion, of course, of uh, North African populations, uh, sort of southern Mediterranean populations, where it's likely to be found. But, you know, we're, we're going into an area here that I uh, really don't know anything about. And oh, yeah. um, because I haven't looked recently at um, new DNA evidence coming out of West African uh, societies, but to my knowledge, uh, it's a relatively rare thing. The places in the world where it's to be found, mm -hmm. uh, outside of um, you know priestly uh, families, 
uh, eastern part of uh, eastern part of Italy, uh, the eastern part of, uh, of Cyprus, and a certain amount in uh, populations like the Druze in southern Lebanon. In other words, the majority of it is exactly in the area where um, historical uh, Jewish populations live. And that would be true also of Eastern Italy. But it's not to be found, for instance, in, uh, you know, you don't, don't find it in uh, Japan or China or, uh, you know, most places in the world. West Africa, basically, I don't know. Okay. Um, this is a question from um, someone is asking. Um, I'm not going to say the names of the people that he said in the email. I'm not going to do that. That's not appropriate. But I'll say this. Um, folks in the community, African American community, are claiming Ashkenazi Jews and other white Jews are fake and identity robbers. Um, does Professor Parfit see this claim as historically valid and appropriate? No, no. I mean, that's a very straightforward one as far as I'm concerned. Um, I think that the um, the evidence um, associating both Ashkenazi and Sephardi Jews uh, well, there's no real difference, to be uh, to be honest, between uh, uh, Sephardi Jews and Ashkenazi Jews. They were the same thing until uh, fairly recently. I mean, you know, the 15th century. And, um, you know, their association with, uh, with the land of Israel and with the history of uh, the Jewish, uh, with the history of the Jews is clear and overwhelming. It cannot be... Um, it cannot be really undone. It's like saying that um, uh, President Trump won the election, right? So um, <laughs> I like that. I like that. So um, it's about that degree of mendacity. Well, I wouldn't use the word mendacity. Again, you know, it's um, it's a complicated matter, and I know that I'm going to be putting my foot in it here um, and I'm likely to upset people but the um, I think the idea is essentially a kind of you know metaphorical association with people of Israel but you know this shouldn't be done in such a way that it's going to um, uh, destroy or invalidate um, or devalue other people's religious experience I think we have to be uh, respectful of each other and um, we have to be respectful of each other's um, uh, traditions, histories, myths and yeah. if people want to believe that one has to be, uh, it, it's part of the wider kind of religious and ethnic and, uh, and uh, identity and God knows the, uh, you know, the experience of African Americans has been, uh, people like yourself, has been very painful, it's a very painful history and uh, painful histories um, sometimes can only really be um, resolved through painful means and this is in a way one of them right. and um, you know it's got to do with race in this particular case I think I don't know whether you want this kind of intellectualization on my part but the way I see it is that um, if you're a slave living in America uh, before the Civil War or indeed you know in the period afterwards during instruction and Jim Crow it was bloody awful if I may use my British term. it was bloody awful and there was no way of extracting yourself from the uh, racial slur of being black right and it's only now really uh, beginning to be possible I would say so let me just give you a little uh, then I'm really going to have to go but I think it's important that maybe some of your guys won't know about this and some of them will but um, the idea of race is not obvious 
and for most of human history nobody thought of it as an idea it wasn't something that was self-evident to people until the end of the 17th century that's the beginning of the racial age when somebody came up with a bright and wrong idea that the world could best be divided into groups which he called races and he came up with seven the guy's name was francois bernier he was a french uh he was a french physician very very important book it started the racial age according to me um we're now getting towards the end of the racial age i hope that um president biden will expedite the end of the racial age we should all stop using the word race because race does not exist it is not a thing there is no biological basis to race at all zero zilch nada it's not a thing and why we have to carry on pretending that it is a thing and that there are biological differences between people is inexplicable to me i'll give you an example of how it can go horribly horribly wrong so covid the papers are full of the fact that african americans are suffering from covid more than others which may very well be true but it's not because african americans are black or african americans are african americans it's because perhaps african americans are poorer and african americans live in more crowded uh, facilities and the result uh, th that is no doubt the result of racism uh, the fact that african americans are poorer and more crowded than other people that is the result of racism i'm not saying that racism doesn't exist it surely does exist what i'm saying is that race does not exist and so a consequence of this i was speaking to a friend of mine who goes to a black church in detroit and she went to her baptist church i think it is the other day and the uh, the pastor said don't take the uh, d don't take the the vaccine um because it won't work on you black people well you know this is very very unhelpful as a message to be giving out to people and uh, similarly the, the the united states government said recently that uh, they don't want to use the oxford vaccine uh, on the grounds that uh, they couldn't be sure it's going to work on black people i mean what kind of uh, bizarre wow you know mind boggling nonsense is this uh, and it all really comes out of the idea that people in america but not so much in europe still believe that races exist you can't fill out a form in the united states without having to put race and when i have to put race i think what are you talking about what am i supposed to put it's nothing there's no such thing as right what do you want from me you're crazy you people so you know it's um, so okay so let's just go back to your question because i know what you said so if you're black here and you know and particularly earlier on in the history of this country uh and you're assumed for wrong reasons of raciology if you want to call it that uh you're, you're assumed to be inferior you're in, assumed to have a different response to disease than white people you are assumed to be more stupid than white people to be more puny than white people to be all kinds of things less than white people until it's useful for white people in which case you might be considered to be stronger and tougher and more resistant to diseases right so i mean this is racialization and so a way out of being considered to be part of this low racial group in the eyes of the whites was to be put yourself into another kind of racial group and so judas uh, you become a jew and it works to some extent oh man hey i want to say um i'm going to end the show now and then i'm going to talk to you off the air for like two minutes and um, i want to say it took a lot out of you 
to do what you did today. A lot of people don't know your situation, but I want to say thank you from the conscious community. This is actually going to, we're going to probably put it on a different channel so we can get a lot of viewers. Your book is Hybrid Hate. The Amazon link is in the chat. I'm going to promote it. I was going to go into um, a couple of questions about the book, but I would urge everybody, there's a chapter that deals with the, the term black and Negro being used in Europe and so forth. It's very important. Um, I was going to ask you about that, but we got to just do it another time. Now is not the time to, you know, to keep you on the air. It's good to keep your mind off something, but I mean, let's end it now. And then, you know, we just arrange to do something else. All right. Yeah. So, yes, sir. I've enjoyed talking to you. Thanks for having me on your show. All right. Give me a second, Dr. Parvid. Peace and love, family. And I'm going to talk to Dr. Parvid off the ear. Thank you for joining and um, share the show. And remember to get the book, Hybrid Hate. Thank you very much. Peace.